I'd also like to mention, and there is our recording. I'd also like to mention that Zoom does offer closed caption services. We've turned it on on our end. And if you would like to take advantage of that, what you need to do is you need to click on the caption button, should be down there somewhere on the bottom of your screen, or possibly under uh, something indicated three dots or more. And if you turn it on on your end, you will have closed captioning for this presentation. All right, so moving on to a more formal welcome, uh, I want to say my name is Eric Fulton. I am the National Program Manager for Customer Outreach and Communication. I'm based out of GSA headquarters in sunny and very cold Washington, D.C. More importantly, I am your host for today's version uh, session of the Client Enrichment Series. We have a great program lined up for you today. We are talking all things cost estimating. Uh, we have a couple, uh, three actually subject matter experts presenting today from different portions of our organization and more behind the scenes who will be taking fielding questions. So let's uh, take a quick moment to learn about today's presenters. Up first is Richard Robert Santiago. He is Cost Management Program Manager at GSA in the PBS Center for Cost Schedule and Tools, and that's out of our Office of Project Delivery in Central Office. He started GSA at 2012 in our Great Lakes region as a general estimator and a cost estimator. And prior to GSA, he worked in the pharmaceutical industry as the CMMS specialist. We also have with us Jason Cook. Jason is a construction analyst. He's also in uh, the PBS Center for Cost Schedule and Tools out of our Office of Project Delivery. Uh, and Jason works on policy development and quality assurance oversight for the cost management program. He holds a Bachelor's of Science in Construction Management from Colorado State University. Uh, and he began his career in the private sector as a project manager uh, and estimator before joining GSA a decade ago. Finally, uh, we have Jason Perrigan with us. He is a program analyst and that is in our reimbursable services program, also out of the Office of Project Delivery here in Central Office. Uh, did I say Jesse? Did I say Jason? I'm going to make sure I say your name correctly. Jesse came to Central Office from one of our regions where he was a construction project manager working to uh, <clears throat> on primarily lease projects. His experience varied in his career from uh, small, uh, small renovations to complex uh, new space projects that's really serving him well in uh, the reimbursable services program, which I think most of our customers know handle things from very small renovations to complex new projects here on the national scale. Prior to his work as the construction program manager, Jesse worked as a leasing specialist for three years. So before we dive into today's presentation, I do want to take care of just a couple of housekeeping things. We have automatically muted uh, the audio on all of your, our attendees' uh, sides, and that is to better control the sound quality of our presentation. Uh, we encourage and anticipate you to submit questions to our subject matter experts today. If you have a question over the course of uh, the presentation about anything you are hearing about, please put it in the Q&A pod. The Q&A pod, again, should be down at the bottom of your screen somewhere. Uh, we have the subject matter experts presenting, but also we have several behind the scenes who will be monitoring those questions as they come in, answering them live. And once they do, those answers will appear in the Q&A pod. Um, if we run out of time, if there are questions that require a little bit more thought uh, than we can put in at the moment, we are going to export all of the questions, those we answer, those we have yet to answer. We're going to have our subject matter experts address each of them, and we're going to turn that around into a formal FAQ document that we will send to everyone who registered for this course today. But it is important to note that all questions on subject matter must go in the Q&A pod. That's where our subject matter experts are. That's where we export the questions. There is another pod and that is the chat pod. Uh, you can use that if you are having technical problems, if you have difficulty with the slides or seeing or hearing something. We have our client enrichment series specialist monitoring the chat. So once again, subject matter questions, please use the Q&A pod. Technical assistance, general comments and praise, you can put that into the chat pod. All right, so before we formally kick things off and I turn things over to Richard, we do have a uh, two poll questions that we want to share just to uh, get things kicked off and get to learn about who we all are. And they're coming up. You can see it on the slide if you have the slide deck. And then the uh, poll pop-up should be coming as well. And we want to know, 
There's my poll pop up. Absolutely. We want to know what is your role within cost estimating or within the uh, cost management program in your agency. A wide variety to choose from. You can know if you're a uh, cost estimator, if you're a project manager, you're a uh, in construction, and then maybe if you're in the budget or finance side, perhaps you have no formal role or your other. You're welcome to, to put your role in the chat. Uh, if I was participating, I would be putting communication specialist in the chat. That is uh, not a formal role in the cost estimating process, but I am here today along with all of you. Let's give another couple of moments before we close this down. I see numbers still rising. All right, so we are going to close the poll and share the results on the screen. And it looks like, yeah, project manager far and away, a majority of folks here, almost 40% identify as a project manager. Uh, but we do have a good group of uh, folks who specialize in cost estimating, budget finance, um, as well as in um, uh, other project coordination and other uh, specialty. So wonderful. Thank you all for joining us. And I scroll down to the second question, which I hadn't gotten to speaking publicly about, but some people have already taken a swing at. Uh, and that is basically how comfortable are you uh, with the process of cost estimating and cost management. And that's on a scale of one to five, um, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, and then uh, we have, oh gosh, wouldn't you know, right in the middle, we we have three uh, being the number one response. So I think a majority of the people who are on this uh, session today are right in the middle of comfort. Not too comfortable, but not too uh, foreign with the concept of cost management and cost estimating. Nice little bell curve there, uh, rising up to three and down to five. So with that information, I think we've gotten to know you all a little bit better. We are going to move that point poll question out of the way, and I'm going to step aside and turn the presentation on over to our subject matter experts, and first up is Richard. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, is my sound coming in clearly? Can you, everybody hear me? If you can do a thumbs up. Um, Loud and clear over here. Yep. Awesome. Perfect. So uh, before we commence and we get into the heat of the game, I want to thank everybody for participating on this forum. We all know that cost management has been a very important topic over the past three years. We have seen some historical unprecedented times that we have been through as agencies in GSA and, and all, all of our federal partners. We have gone through a lot of challenges trying to make things work with respect to how our projects are being funded, how do we quantify them, how do we properly plan for contingencies, and how do we necessarily plan the best project within the constraints and the lack of information that we have at a planning stage. So I really wanted to thank each and every one of you for your time of coming into the session. This is gonna be a broad overview, but I do wanna open the possibility in the future for any me or any of the resources that I manage. Jason, Greg is on the background. We have Jesse on the RWA group. We have Rachel, we have Laura Beth. We also have Brandon Duffy on the line. Any one of these resources in the future. If any agency or any GSA partner that is in here in the call needs any in-depth guidance or any discussion that we have to hold after the session, I'm opening the channels right now after we are we end up um we we can put ourselves in contact and, and deal with any particular situations that might happen with that being said um i want to go a little bit over the agenda more so what we're going to be covering today we're going to go over what is cost management what is in the project's life cycle and how does cost management fit in also like what is needed for good cost estimating why do estimates vary and what resources are available to support cost management. And then at the end of the day, you know, throughout the presentation, there is a Q&A chat in the, in the link, in the Zoom meeting that you really can use. And there's going to be Greg, Brandon, Laura Beth, Rachel, and Ashley are going to be in the background responding to any session, any question that happens in the, in the meantime. Without further ado, let's go to the next slide and get, our, 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 get ourselves going. Okay. So, you might be thinking about, okay, what is cost management, right? We talk about cost management, but how GSA sees cost management is that it is concerned with the process of planning and controlling the project development to remain within scope and within budget. That is really important. Without a scope, there's no budget, right? Or the budget is being constituted and not tied into a particular reach of work of how you're going to perform in your project. So there's 
three main components in cost management that we identify in GSA. The first one is cost estimating, which is a forecast of financial and other resources needed to complete a project with a defined scope. Really important. Um, forecast of financial and other resources. Think about cost estimating being part art, part science. Um, if there are some colleagues from NOAA, National Weather Service, I compare an estimate to here again. I'm from Puerto Rico originally, uh, for those of, of you who didn't figure it out at this point, right, with my accent and, 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 and how I speak. Uh, we had a lot of hurricanes, right? And when meteorologists talk about hurricanes, there's a margin of error. In the same way, depending out on how close you are to the award date in a project, a hurricane path can be predicted a little bit more accurately if it's closer to the site where the hurricane will hit. So I compare estimates as forecasting a hurricane. Yes, tangibly is different, but you can relate the analogy. And, and that is what we do in cost estimating. It is part art, part science. Like there's no way that an estimate and a bid are gonna come in at the exact same dollars. Yes, it has happened in the past, but chances are there's gonna be some deltas, discrepancies and differences because there's two individuals that are totally separately minded that are generating two different products. And you can have three estimates done in a particular project and all three of those estimates are gonna be totally different. That is why we have to reconcile those estimates when there's a three-party, four-party process. But with that being said, the next step in our cost management process is project budgeting. Project budgeting goes above and beyond a cost estimate. The budgeting is the sum of all the estimated costs. It includes the design, the management and inspection, the contract support needed to do, the personal property, the furniture, the fixtures, the equipment, and all these other components that are needed in order to make the project happen. And then it defines the funds authorized to execute the project, all these other minutiae that are added into the project process in order to make it holistic. And then the cost control component is also really important. And that is a topic that you as leasing contracting officers, project managers that are on the line, the interior designers, you have to begin with the end of mind and make sure that you are establishing the proper process controls in your cost management cycle from the cradle to the cradle of the project, and that's how I see it, to be able to fall within budget, within the constraints of the budget that you have for your project. And, and there are processes that you're able to take into, into account in order to make sure that your project is moving forward within the constraints and the boundaries of the budget that you have to establish. It doesn't always work, but the earlier you identify the risks and you mitigate the risks in your project, the more successful you're gonna be in delivering within budget. And we can go to the next slide, please, Jason. So Jason, uh, I think uh, let's go to the next one. Okay, uh, what is needed for a reliable estimate? I mean, what are the things that you guys in your in your own duties need to generate a reliable estimate? Really important that we have a successful vision, a clearly articulated one. And if we don't have a vision of the project, unfortunately, we're going to be scoping an item that might be misaligned with what your stakeholders or you envision for your project taking place. The scope definition is really critical in order to make a, an estimate successful. The more details, the less assumptions. That's kind of how it, it pairs up. The more details you have on your project, the less assumptions the estimator is going to do in order to price that project out. And the parameters and the expectations on the constraints that you have on your project. Knowing where the project is going to take place helps a lot. Or the find the most information that we have at the time that we are budgeting the project that we have will help us. And then stakeholders, stakeholders, stakeholder communication early, often, and continuous. It's really important. And we need to calibrate estimates as the needs evolve, right? From the planning stage, a planning stage can last longer than an execution phase because we all know the funding challenges that many of us have in our federal agencies. So by the time that we know that a project needs to take place, at the time that we have to issue the funding, there, is, there could be a significant gap where the old estimate might not be updated to market. It might not even reflect the scope modifications that have happened throughout the course of the studies that we've done year after year after year. So those are the things that we have to keep in mind. We have to recalibrate that scope periodically to make sure that the scope is aligned with the expectations of the stakeholders and the partners and everybody that is involved in, in making sure that the project is successfully delivered. Next slide. 
So Jason, any thoughts on the next slide that you have for us? So when we're developing our ideal scope of work, there's a lot of things we need to take into consideration, but we need to make sure that our scope uh, is clear and understandable. A lot of the things that we look for is making sure that it's organized. Uh, organization can be uh, in an industry standard form, uh, making sure it's sequential so that it's logical for the users and for the stakeholders to understand what's in the scope. We also want to review the alignment between our stakeholders and all the parties that are involved in the project, make sure that we have all the requirements that we need inside of the scope of work are accounted for, whether it's an assumption or a risk assessment of the of the scope that we have to include those requirements. And the scope of work uh, uh, overall just needs to be concise, tell the story of the project so that we can understand what the costs are going to be associated with all the work that's included in the scope. Awesome. In addition to that, to add a little bit about writing the scope of work, what are the items that we should be paying attention to, right? And in order to adequately estimate a project, it is really important that we develop the scope in adequate details and that the expectations are clear, that we are not omitting information about what does my customer or my partner, my stakeholder expect from the project that I'm delivering. The items that should be part of the scope are, what are the existing conditions? Do I have to deal with hazardous materials on a federal setting? Um, am I going into a market that might have limited, limited availability of the type of space that we are seeking and sourcing? Working hours, do I have, can I make the project work during regular the eight to five schedule or do I have to account for premium time? Do I have to account for a shift differential? Um, am I going into a heavily union market where I need to take care of a higher fringe and prevailing wages? Um, do I need special clearances to execute my project? Um, there are some of our partners and, and federal agencies who do need that extra level of scrutiny and so that the resources are, are there for, for their mission purposes. The period of performance, how much time do I have to execute my project? And how much of that time is actually construction execution? What actual time is actually design execution? And also account for the gaps that could happen within the schedule. So a schedule generation is also critical in this process, um, at least a milestone one at the time that we're budgeting the project. Subject matter support, to actually know what items, I mean, I cannot know what I don't know. That is why I need to bring the subject matter experts on um, specialty items that need to be accounted for in the estimate. Some restrictions. I might not be able to work on a certain room on a certain time. I am not able to touch a mechanical or an electrical system until the weekends. Those are restrictions that get placed in the estimate. And that those restrictions, typically in an estimate process, get priced separately or differently than what we do with the rest of the scope. Market conditions, this is a really important one. Not all of our markets geographically behave the same way. There are some markets that are hot or they're a little bit milder with respect to the labor, the materials, the equipment, the accessibility of the site, all those all those things matter in an estimate because I might be missing some general condition factors that need to be weighed into the project. And also the clear statement of the need. And it, that is the most important thing that we need to know. If we're misaligned, the estimate is accounting for a scope that is not realistic with what the customer expectation is. We already failed from the beginning. So we've got to make sure that the clear statement of the need is described in the scope of work and that I'm accounting for all those items that are being asked for and also uh, accounted for in the estimate per se. Next slide. Really important. All the PBS estimates that we generate here in GSA are prepared in accordance with industry and professional standards or methodologies. So now I'm gonna open it for Jason to carry over this slide description. Right, so I guess, uh... Big general question is why do our estimates vary, um, and that's uh, that's a pretty common one. And and much like what Richard was explaining earlier, we have a lot of different um, uh, forecasting the future uh, predictions that we have to make in our estimates. We use mathematical calculations to do that, but we do get variances, and there's a lot of different factors that affect that. So our project scope being as detailed as it can be at the stage or the phase of the project that we're at is is critical to making sure that we have as much information as we can to be able to price out mathematically what we need for our project costs. Um, 
some of the other factors that affect that cost though is the scale of the project. Uh, the scale of the project can uh, affect the economic, uh, the economy of scale we get on materials, on labor market we get. Um, it can affect uh, just the overall square footages. Typically large projects will be able to uh, reduce the square footage costs over a small project, um, depending on the square footage of it. We also need uh, um, more detail in our scope so that we can actually pinpoint the areas of risk, areas of assumptions that we need in order to cover additional costs that may not be clear or uh, um, defined um, adequately early on in the stages of the project scope development. And then the timing of the market and uh, prevailing conditions that we have. Uh, this can be um, an effect on the labor that we have in our market, whether or not we think that our project uh, has a large amount of the scope in the electrical uh, fields, and we're going to have a shortage of electricians at the time of the, the project is being solicited or the project is underway. Um, these are the kinds of things that are going to affect our costs, and we need to take into account or make assumptions to forecast the future, which is also why we have variances because the future doesn't always lay out the way that we, uh, we're trying to forecast it. And then the locality of the project. When we're looking at historical data, when we're looking at uh, previous projects that we had, is it in a different location? Is that locality, um, uh, that location have an, have, have an effect on the, uh, the delivery of the materials that we have or a shortage in labor or a surplus in labor? which can affect it in a positive way for our project cost. Um, again, we're trying to forecast the future using mathematical methods. So it is a little bit of a, a difficulty to pinpoint the exact cost, which is why we, we say that we are estimators, not exactimators. But it does help that uh, we can pinpoint and identify as much assumptions and potential risks as we have in order to reduce the amount of variance that we will have in our in our project costs versus the actual market bids that we get once the project comes to uh, solicitation. Awesome. Size does matter with respect to construction projects. Smaller projects do not have the same general conditions and requirements that larger projects do. So it is really important that we account for what the scope is so that we can have an idea of what type of complexities are needed to be added in the cost estimate per se. So it is really important that we do the best studies that we can and we have the opportunity and the pre-project analysis, feasibility studies are required for large projects. Typically smaller projects have a little bit of a quicker life cycle than larger projects do. So it is really important that we do the due diligence of studying the projects that are gonna be more complex in nature so that we can have a better understanding of what goes into them at the time that I'm executing in the planning phase and so on in the life cycle of the project. Smaller projects tend to be more of a quicker turnaround, but that doesn't mean that a study and analysis or, or pre-design cannot be done in them. So I would strongly urge that we can research the type of project that we're doing before we can, uh, so that we can have the maximum detail uh, appropriate for a budgetary phase and so on. And then after the, the life cycle of the project keeps developing, then we can, we can sharpen the pencil on those estimates now that we can start identifying all those, unconven all those unforeseen conditions that are being encountered in the project cycle. Um, and that, that is pretty much uh, how we go with respect to how we estimate large versus small projects. Without further ado, what I want to do is transition now to Jesse Perigin so that he can take the RWA portion. <laughs> Hey everybody, uh, I'm Jesse. I work for the National RWA program. As I said before in my introduction, I'm gonna kind of talk about how this, <clears throat> the cost management and the RWA process fit together. So super high level, um, this isn't an RWA training, but kind of like how do we fit what you're learning about in this training into our RWA process. So what you're looking at here is an overview of the project life cycle. Um, we have the outset, project identification, initiation, planning, execution, closeout. Um, we're going to switch over to the next slide here, and we're going to look at the first couple of these and focus in a bit more. So how is the process started? Well, this is via the work request getting submitted in eRita. That is what kicks off this process, um, and that's what gets the RWA process uh, started as well. So quick overview of RWA specific process. Um, you have the customer yourselves creates the work request that comes to GSA. GSA assigns a PM. Um, 
there's some varying amount of project planning uh, requirements developed that happens in order to get an estimate and therefore an SCE, a summary cost estimate. Um, the PM creates that with a number amount, it goes back to the customer and that's what gives you the ability to submit an RWA for acceptance. Um, so when we're talking about the, the estimate and the SCE, keep in mind that up until you have an accepted RWA, it's very easy and um, in fact, it's something you should do. You should have your PM um, update that SCE as needed. So for an example, you have a project that came in in October, you had some estimates created, um, PM created an SCE, but then something happened and the project is just kind of sitting stale up until now. You want to submit the funding for that project, but that might not be the best idea. What you want to do is talk to your PM at GSA, have them revalidate that SCE, make sure everything is up to date, the costs are still valid, um, have them uh, discuss that with you, whether or not that's a new set SCE or it's the same one, um, and that can get that process moving again. So the big takeaway here is SCEs can and should be updated, and they can be very easily updated up until the day of an RWA acceptance. Um, so let's switch over to the next slide here, look at some more of this project lifecycle. So this is project execution to close out. So I'm gonna kind of frame this in the, in the realm of an accepted RWA. So you're working on your project, whether that's um, design, whether that's construction, swinging hammers, um, and you have an accepted RWA, can things change? Um, obviously, yes, the cost can change. Um, the only catch here is that once you have an accepted RWA and you see some sort of um, cost change, it's going to require that you go through the RWA amendment process. So there's kind of your line in the sand. Before acceptance, you can change the SCE, revalidate, make sure things are good. But as soon as that RWA is accepted, you're gonna to have to go through the RWA amendment process. There's all sorts of caveats and rules surrounding that. We're not gonna get into that today. That's more of an RWA specific training thing. But I think the big takeaway is once you have an accepted RWA and your cost change, it's slightly more burdensome to move forward. So let's switch over to the next slide. Okay, so these are estimate types. Um, in that first column in there, you're going to see uh, kind of a list of uh, varying degrees of accuracy that you would assign in an SCE, summary cost estimate, to your estimate. So with the first one, order of magnitude, you're looking at um, 75 plus 75 to minus 40. So what does that mean? Uh, $100,000 SCE, you should assume that that SCE very well could, once that project is finished, it could be $175,000 or it could be $60,000. Um, so this is kind of an assignment of how accurate and the risk of change that you might see in that estimate. Um, we have varying ones and they tighten the accuracy as we find out more details. So as you can see in the information available section there, as more things happen with the project, um, so for example, scope of work is finalized, um, the design documents are finalized, and finally you have a, con a contractor bid, you're tightening that estimate and you're more sure that that result will stay within a certain um, limitation. So for example, we're gonna switch over to the next slide and we're gonna do two quick poll questions on these examples. I'm waiting for the polls to pop up and Okay, well, let me just go ahead and read these to you all. Um, so we have two examples here. Um, we have the same set of answers and there's gonna be a certain level of detail between the two that's gonna vary. So example one, 
On, October, on August 25, you submit an RWA to completely remodel your office. There's been no prior discussion with GSA, no design, requirements are undefined, and there's no opportunity for a site visit before end of year. What type of estimate should you expect? So um, takeaways from this one. Um, the fact that there's very, very little information here, very little detail. So that is going to be a order of magnitude. That's the type of estimate that you would expect. You don't have a lot of detail, um, but you can gain more detail. So let's switch over to example number two on November 25. Keep in mind, these are the same example. So it's kind of showing this linear progress of the project. On November 25, you submit an RWA for the design to completely remodel your office. A work request has been submitted into eRita. Site visits have occurred. Estimates develop, scope of work and requirements develop finalized. What type of estimate should you expect? I'm gonna wait a second here. I am seeing like little um, uh, chats pop up. So I am kind of seeing uh, some of the answers here. Let everybody think about it. So I'm going to say that I'm seeing a lot of Bs, which is the right answer. Um, we have um, a site visit, we have more estimates developed, we have a finalized scope of work, um, finalized requirements. So these are all things that are gonna lead you to having a budgetary estimate, plus or minus 30%. So much tighter than order of magnitude. I mean, order of magnitude is plus 75%. So you really tighten that up. Um, not quite a construction estimate, but uh, this is actually the prelude to that. Okay, let's switch on over to the next slide. Okay, so I've been saying a lot of stuff about SCEs, and this is actually a screen grab of what the SCE format looks like in Rita. Um, I'm assuming most of you all have Rita access, eRita access, um, and this is the way that a PM at GSA will capture the relevant estimates and put them into the RWA and send them your way for um, approval and funding. So. I want to highlight here a big thing is that an SCE is not the estimates. The estimates are a separate document. They're going to be created and then they are put into the SCE. The SCE is a way to take those estimates and calculate the RWA costs. So there's a lot of cases where you can have um, multiple estimates captured within one SCE. So think, for example, large project, you have move costs, there's an estimate, you have furniture costs, there's an estimate. Those are all gonna be separate line items estimated and then put into the SCE, which is then going to calculate it and spit out a number that has an RWA fee assigned to it. You're gonna see here that we have those estimate types and the project phase. These do not have uh, an impact on the number that the ST, SCE spits out. So if the SCE is spitting out a million dollars because you select any of these specific estimate types, it's not gonna change that. What this is, is that when you see this as a customer, it should just be kind of a risk assessment in your head. Hey, this is an estimate, it's for $100,000, but the PM at GSA is telling me it's an order of magnitude. So just keep it in the back of your head that that can very well swing um, as the project progresses. Okay, so let's switch on over. This is the second tab of the SCE. You can see on the side there, for, there's five tabs there. That first one we looked at was basic information. This is base project cost. So this is where the vast majority of kind of the big line items of your construction are gonna go in. You can see you have GSA shell costs and tenant um, TI costs split out there. That's in green. Um, you also have contingency. You should expect to see contingency. Your GSA PM should be doing that in line with either your P120 or best market practices. And all this is calculated uh, and spit out on that right hand box there, total estimated RWA authorized amount. So that's it for me. I'm gonna kick it back to Richard or Jason. All right, thanks, Jesse. Um, so I guess we've talked a lot about the variances of uh, the estimate and um, 
some of the things we want to explain is how we mitigate those uh, those variances and the unknowns that we have in our project. Uh, we mentioned that we, we're trying to forecast the future uh, with our estimates using the mathematical methods. Uh, one of the mit mitigation methods that we have is our escalation. Uh, the escalation process that we've used <clears throat> in the past has been an average, a 10-year average of uh, cost escalation and increases that we see in our projects. But a couple of years ago, GSAs, we actually switched as a team to go to a forward-looking method, uh, a little bit more calculation and, and accounting for large variances that we see in the market and in the industry as a whole. Anybody who's put together an estimate in the last uh, four or five years knows that before 2020 and uh, COVID shutdowns and impacts that we see all there, um, the market was relatively steady, but after the uh, the impacts of the shutdowns, we saw large variances, both the material and labor costs, because we were getting shortages, we were getting long delays, uh, long lead items on the costs. So using a forward-looking escalation method, we updated every year to be targeted and focus on what the anticipated escalation cost is for the next several years in a row and then slowly taper off to a more steady increase of escalation costs that we think that uh, projects are gonna need. Um, it does make it difficult if we have a project that we're requesting and it's several years out, uh, but we also know that uh, we need to account for large variances that we, the market may see and um, the industry experts are actually anticipating as well. So where do we get uh, our cost data that helps us? Uh, this is another area of mitigation. We need to make sure we have accurate cost data. Uh, GSA uses several points for our cost data collection. Uh, we use the industry standard data for our, um, our estimating templates and tools. Uh, this is something that's used across the industry for all uh, private sector and governments. And we use that in our, in our own um, custom estimating systems that we have. But we also use historical data. Uh, historical data tells us what the actual costs are gonna, uh, that we've seen on projects. And we can use that as a comparison of what the industry cost data is showing us and see where the variances are there and where we need to make adjustments. And the historical data, much like using a 10-year average, it's only good for so long before uh, the variances that we see in our project costs uh, are, are included in that historical data. So using a, a square foot cost from a, a similar project in a similar city that's 10 years old might not be helpful for you. It might help you uh, understand some of the scope that you might need, but the, the price needs to be adjusted to current market conditions. Uh, but this is all the areas that we look at when we're developing our internal tools and internal cost uh, uh, items in order to develop um, all of our estimates varying from rough order magnitude parametric estimates all the way down to our detailed estimates that we have. I think I go now, right? To talk about uh, yeah. contingency rates and locality market adjustments. So um, we had uh, a participant, Amy Rice, ask about is contingency is always 10%. The answer is it depends, right? So in GSA, we have two components of contingency within our cost breakdown structure. One is the design contingency that applies if we are funding a project, either federally or leasing, with respect to design and construction funds altogether, and we are running a single funding source to run the project in particular. You, we recommend that at a minimum, you carry a 10% contingency for design and a 10% contingency for construction. Those contingencies do not get marked up in the same way. The design contingency is typically another scope item. You're blowing your direct costs by 10%, right? And then you mark up that design contingency across the cost breakdown structure. And then that becomes part of your scope within the estimated cost of construction at award, which is the ECCA that gets put in the summary cost estimate that Jesse was talking about earlier on. Um, and then the construction contingency is what you have. In other words, that could be the owner's contingency in the private sector. So we do have two buckets of contingency that we use in our cost breakdown structures. And this comes from industry practices. It is really important to carry those buckets because that allows you to um, cover any unforeseen throughout the design process with respect to the construction dollars in particular that I'm budgeting for. The earlier I am budgeting without lesser details, the more riskier the budget is established. So we want to carry those buckets and then try to maintain that construction bucket or contingency as much as possible. Um, with that being said, 
along the contingency rates and the locality market adjustments. Um, labor adjustments, we're working towards adjusting labor for increased rates and, and labor shortages across the nation. GSA just invested in a program throughout the CIR analytics platform. And that's how we are also on demand or depending on critical projects right now, we are running a market study for our labor so that we're able to quantify for any labor shortages. So here's how it works in a nutshell, right? We take a project that is gonna be executed within the next year and a half, and we have a four year window availability on this construction tool that allows us to measure a particular market and their labor reality and what trades are gonna be shortfalled or, or short in a particular market. And that allows us to compare what is the scope of my project? What trades do I need? And how do those compare with the market influx or the lack thereof, right? What am I missing from my market? So that is where we take that into account to calibrate the labor costs. If we have to put labor premium or compete more for the labor trades that are within that particular market. Um, and also we make sure that there, if there are some material supply chain premiums, we account for those in the estimate as well. Recently, we're still seeing semiconductor shortages. We're still seeing that. We're seeing switch gears that are taking more than 52 weeks to be delivered on site. VAB boxes, things that commodities that you used to be able to buy off the shelf. We're still seeing lead times of six months to nine months on those. Um, and, and those are things that we are making sure that we're accounting for in a particular market. But that has to be analyzed with the schedule, the milestone schedule that we generate on a project. We got to make sure that we are accounting. When is my midpoint going to hit? And how does my labor projection look? And is the material shortage still going to be mitigated? So with that being said, um, other items that are going to come, if your project is more than $35 million, there's a project labor agreement mandate that we have to comply with. So we have to make sure that we are accounting for union labor wages in those particular projects or organized labor wages in that particular project across the board if the project exceeds $35 million. Um, we got to account if we have to comply with low embodied carbon materials and also uh, the requirements for sustainability and net zero. All those things have to be hatched out um, both on the scope of work and also on the estimate side of the fence. Um, next slide. What is GSA doing across the board to try to mitigate some of the risks that we're seeing and some of the unforeseen conditions that we are seeing and some of our projects. Well, we are participating also with other federal partners in their interagency forum. We meet monthly and we discuss all the um, all the, the heartburns that we're seeing in the cost management arena and, and cost management as a profession in the federal government and what are the best practices, uh, risk tools. We discuss also, what are you accounting? What are you seeing in the markets? So we also feed ourselves from, from the, what are other federal partners that do uh, like heavy estimating, they have full-time cost estimators doing these estimates. What do we learn from them? And we retrofeed and we've, we've gotten good results out of that. And we participate in forums across the board. And I just mentioned the second point on the slide deck a little bit ahead of time. So we, we are, we're using also a contingency determination tool, developing a tool um, to try to uh, pilot an effort to, for contingency calculation. What we want to use is we, we want to move towards the point that we are using risk risks in our projects to account for proper contingency in our projects using some sort of Monte Carlo simulation. And we're moving forward in that project. After we develop the tool, we're gonna to pilot it and see how it works with the overall project cycle, because what we wanna do is we wanna make it more efficient and not become not have the tool become a roadblock towards the customers or the stakeholders receiving or executing a particular project at a particular stage. We wanna create the tool to make it easier on the project teams to deploy and develop projects because they help they help you build a more robust budget and you are aware of the certain risk that you either have to account for or mitigate uh, throughout the project process. There could be two determinations done as a project team. You either carry the risk and you mitigate it, or we account for it in the estimate uh, in a separate bucket of money or in a, in a lot of bucket of money. But um, we want to steer away from the arbitrary contingency model. And that's, that's what GSA is working towards. Um, there should be a minimum contingency based on, the, on, on what we know historically in projects, but it should be a little bit more of a scientific approach based on, 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 on probability. And, and that's what we're gonna be moving, moving towards in the next couple of years. 
Next slide. So a little bit of a case study in market volatility, like we had a tenant project in Detroit, um, April, 2021, we established the estimated cost of construction at $2.463 million. When we, the market conditions were so tight that in 2021, we received a bid for $3.75 million. Um, when we interviewed the contractor, we discovered trade shortages in the market, commodity market spikes, market uncertainty, and the, and the estimate pricing point was low. Um, we didn't have the latest and greatest data on the estimate uh, that was used to generate uh, and, and carry forward the procurement. Therefore, we, after negotiations, we arrived at $3.5 million. Those are, are things that we have seen in the past. Lately, we have to recalibrate the data and see what we're seeing in the markets, and, and we can get more information in the in long term. Um, the second case on a prospectus project that I'm going to mention, it was in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, it was a plumbing project, and we, out, we went out to bid two times. The budget for the project was $3.5 million. The first bid round was, you know, the low bidder came in at 59 and then the second bid round came at 8.8. .8. So we this discrepancy between the budgetary figure and the award figure is significant, right? Or the, the bid figure. So at this, this time, GSA opted to pivot the delivery method to try to build a D-scope project. We had to reduce the scope on the project and go out with a different procurement vehicle to try to get some of the scope that we intended to pursue originally done in the project. Um, that gives you a perspective of the things that we're seeing in the market lately. This, these two projects are a little bit more outdated, but we are still seeing some of those consequences in the recent projects that we have been uh, awarding. Not as drastic as these examples that we brought into the table, but we're still seeing some remnants of the supply chain uh, and, the, and, the, and the trade shortages um, that we're seeing in the market. Next slide. Some of the lessons learned that we have learned throughout the market volatility, um, is to estimate current costs based on latest data. Don't, don't use the data that was used four years ago. The, that's no good data anyway. It's not good. So also blanket percentages can wildly over or undershoot the potential risks, right? Don't, don't just put like, oh, let's just put 10% more on this estimate and, and we're good to go. We need, we need to go back to the market. Um, Jason, any additional comments on, on, on lessons learned here? Yeah, the, uh, the closer to the bid date that you can make modifications to your estimate, uh, the better it is. But also making sure that throughout the, the pre-construction process, coordinating uh, as often as possible with the estimating, uh, with the scope of work and the estimator, if it's uh, different parties, to make sure that you're still aligned um, and making sure that the estimator is connected to the current markets. This way you can understand what the labor uh, market volatility is the, the material market is um, but the estimator should be connected to all that and the more touch the more uh, uh, phases where you can touch uh, basis with the estimator the more accurate uh, the information they can uh, give you awesome and then one good advice that i have for everybody is yeah design to 90 right i'm going to reiterate on that point Let's design to 90. If we are going through a design, let's make sure that we have a little bit of buffer because we can expect some unforeseen on the procurement process. Um, also, active budget management. Let's make sure that we are accounting for the things that we're accounting and controlling the cost in our projects as much as possible. Um, let's try to get some competition there. I know it's kind of tough in today's market environment, but competing the, the procurements is, is, is huge. If in the leasing world, um, it's, it's all driven by the lessors, right? Make the lessors comply with the lease. And the lease asks for, you know, there, there's multiple options to compete the lease. could be, uh, and, and then the leasing portion, reach out to your leasing counterpart um, in GSA, and they're going to be able to guide you in the proper section of the contract. But we, we urge competition. It gives you a market realism component. Jason, about value management, what can we say? Uh, well, looking for our value management doesn't always mean looking for value to engineering or decreasing the cost of, a, of a, the project by uh, adding cheaper products to it. We're looking for um, opportunities to save costs in the project, but this could be through uh, 
coming up with a different approach to the project, whether it's a different uh, kind of HVAC system approach or um, an approach to phasing your project in order to make um, make the best use of the resources that you have in your actual market. So value management, uh, it's critical to track that actually early on in the stage, where you think opportunities are, uh, connecting with the design team once they've actually gotten on board and making sure they understand and they're tracking their value uh, management areas. And then uh, if any of the uh, the assumptions that are being made early in the project need to change based on an opportunity for value added to the project, then that needs to be accounted for in your cost estimates as well. Um, and then funding timing. Uh, so that's this is another area where we get uh, uh, an opportunity to mitigate, mitigate some risks that we have. Um, the shorter time frame on when the funding is in place to the execution always helps a project uh, reduce the risk of escalation on materials and volatility in the labor and material market itself. Um, and this can come from whether or not you're still waiting on funding to come through, or uh, there's just a long drawn out process between actually uh, allocating the funds and executing the award of the actual project itself. Or um, if your project is drawn out over a long, uh, a multiple year type project and your funds are being uh, allocated in phases like that, all of this affects the way that your project's going to be able to use those funds based on the escalation of the market. Um, like I said, with the labor material uh, and just general increases that we see. Awesome. And I'm going to pass it over to Eric uh, for the next slide. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. sir. Oh, excellent. Oh, thank you guys so far. So good. Um, do want to uh, bring everybody's attention to the Project Pulse survey slide, uh, which is kind of like our feedback loop here at uh, GSA. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to read everything up on the slide, but this is something that we have put into place. Um, and it's just like it says, it's a pulse check at a couple of different points along the way um, for us to better understand how you're feeling about our service on your project, how we can improve. We take the information uh, gathered from the Project Pulse survey, and we use that kind of incorporate into our new best practices and lessons learned like we were just talking about. Um, and that gets sent out, I believe, once a month on the 15th at various times uh, throughout the life cycle of a project. We have a fact sheet on it, which uh, I or someone else will drop the link in the chat to uh, that really goes over uh, all the ins and outs of the Project Pulse Survey. Yes, we can move to what the next slide is. So summarizing what we just learned in the training, early planning does help improve the scope development. That's, I think, the main message about this session. The well-defined scope leads to a more accurate estimation of the cost. The current market data should be used when doing cost management exercises. Let's use proper escalation. Let's put our, out the milestone schedules to the best of our ability. And also, let's communicate with our customer stakeholders and our parties to make sure that we are following the proper steps, following the scope along, and making sure that the project lifecycle is being followed in the best of possible ways. This is gonna lead us into success. Um, and that's pretty much what we had for the presentation today. Uh, if there's any additional questions or comments, I'm gonna be in the chat box responding to some of the comments and questions. Uh, and I'm gonna be here uh, for, I'm gonna be here for a little while uh, addressing any future questions that you guys might have with respect to the session. I do wanna take the opportunity for thanking, uh, let's thank Ashley, uh, Laura Beth, uh, Rachel Bixel, um, and Jesse for assisting us with this presentation. I also wanna thank Jason Cook, Greg Fowler, Brandon Duffy for helping us. And I also wanna thank uh, from our uh, customer team, I wanna thank uh, Rebecca, I wanna thank Eric and also Andrea uh, for helping us lead the effort. and. I am more than available. My name is Richard, last name Robert Santiago. I, uh, I uh, as, as, as Eric was mentioning, I am leading the HOSP program. And also, um, whatever you need, guys need from us in OPD, 
please uh, feel free to extend uh, an invitation and we'll be more than happy to assist. Well, Richard, I want to thank you because you did a great job on this presentation um, and we all appreciate the kudos, but I want to, to make sure we get right back uh, to you. Um, so we have some information up on the slide, just the, the names of, of our presenters. I'm going to stall for a little bit of time because as uh, Richard said, um, we have um, the Q&A pod is open as long as uh, you can hear the sound of my voice and we are live on the webinar. Um, and so the subject matter experts are working behind the scenes to answer those questions. Uh, but well, if we do run out of time and our session is coming to a close here soon, uh, we will take all of the questions that are in that chat pod, those we have answered, those we have not had a chance to answer, pull those out, and then uh, the, the appropriate subject matter experts uh, will answer those questions. We'll turn those around into a formal Q&A document. So as long as you can hear the sound of my voice, you have a chance to put your questions in. Um, and then obviously, you can always reach out directly to our subject matter experts if you have other questions. Uh, so if you want to go on over to the next slide. Excellent. I want to talk a little bit about some of the upcoming client enrichment series sessions that we have. Um, I don't know the breakdown of how many of you are first timers or how many of you are client enrichment series regulars, but we do have two great presentations coming up here in the uh, next couple of weeks. On uh, February 15th, we will have water quality management in GSA buildings. Uh, and so you can learn more and register for that today. And then the following week, we will have uh, a recurring favorite RWA policy and process uh, fundamentals. And uh, I know that uh, Jesse and team will be back for that. That is on Thursday, February 22nd. Um, and you can sign up for that. Uh, the link, don't do what I'm attempting to do right now and click on the link on your screen to see if it works. It doesn't work. Uh, what you can do is wait, we will hand out the slides with functional links or you can go to www.gsa.gov slash CES and that will take you to our client enrichment series homepage. Um, also there at the bottom, I, I mentioned at the top of our presentation, this is being recorded and we take our recorded sessions, put them online. We have our own YouTube channel. The link for that you can see right there on the slides that'll be available to you and we'll pop that into the chat. So you can uh, take these classes 24 seven. You can leave us a comment, hit the like button, all the fun stuff that uh, we do on YouTube. Uh, so we're coming down to the end of our session. Once again, I wanna thank, uh, all of our presenters today, both those in front of the camera and those who have been working behind the scenes, as well as the client enrichment series team uh, handling a lot of the technical things along the way. Most of all, I want to thank all of our customers for joining us today. Uh, we had a huge registration number, a huge number of attendees today. Uh, so we appreciate it. We're always looking for more and better ways to uh, service our customers. And I just want to remind everyone that the goal of the client enrichment series is to engage our audience, our customers, in workplace topics that contribute to your mission success and to cost of the cost effective management of your real estate and workplace programs. Once again, you have a few more moments to get your questions into the chat, um, but otherwise I am going to say thank you all from all of us here at GSA and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.